okay, we should be okay. Okay, cool. So I'm very excited to have Thais Ruman here uh, today. So Thais, as I understand, you're nearly finishing your PhD student, uh, PhD, sorry, PhD at all, at the Hassel Blattner Institute. So for those who know, I spent two years roughly over there during a, doing a postdoc. <coughs> And I think we cross over, right? We, we were never really, you know, at the same time. I think when I left somehow uh, shortly after you joined. And uh, since then, like it, you've been doing quite some fantastic work, um, mainly focusing on, I guess, uh, um, fabrication, like and how we can uh, 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 make all this modeling process more accessible to end users through a, a bunch of software and lots of interesting and crazy artifacts. So um, yeah, we're really looking forward for, you know, sort of a synthesis of all the work you've done. So up to you. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. So yeah, my name is Thijs Rauman. I'm from the Hasse Plattner Institute and I work together with Patrick Baudis on my work on portable laser cutting. I welcome you all to my presentation. All right, so when I started to do research into laser cutting, this is roughly what it looked like, right? You would send like a 2D cutting plan to a laser, which, which is a vector file. And that's a very clever format if you think of it, because like it contains like some sort of preview of what the result is going to look like. You can send it to the laser cutter. It works essentially on all different laser cutters. So um, super clever way of interacting with the machine, I think. And um, today I'm, going, I'm here to tell you that this way of working with laser cutters has to end. So I'm going to kill this format. But before I go there, let's talk about uh, computing, a context that we are all more familiar with. So when I try to understand like what the future of digital fabrication is going to be like, uh, what I essentially do is like look, look at like what we already have seen in the history of digital computing and see if there are any parallels or any ways that we can learn from the history and see what we can do um, to, to influence the field of, of digital fabrication, the way it's developing. So you've seen the curves like this, right? With the amount of users or the amount of devices that are um, um, uh, making use of digital computing. And, uh, and I think with fabrication, we are somewhere here. Like, like I know we're starting to catch up, but you know, we're not quite at the same level where computing is obviously, where we now have like, you know, billions of users. So it's not, not necessarily said that like digital fabrication will follow the same trends as, as computing has followed. But I think it's interesting to look at like pivotal moments in history and see if we can make it, if we can enable it to kind of follow a similar trend. And so like, for example, there has been a really big pivotal moment lately in, in the context of, fabric, of, uh, of, of digital computing, which was the introduction of mobile computing, right? So when mobile computing happened, like suddenly from millions of users of computing, we went to billions of users of computing or essentially everybody. Um, and so like I was, I, that, that got me wondering, right? As a researcher, like, well, what would that mean in the context of fabrication? So we just did some sort of provocative like envisionment of what that future would be like. And, you know, imagining like that there would be something which would be mobile fabrication. So here's just some sort of envisionment video that we kind of shot back then for WIS 2016, where we just wanted to know like with the current state of hardware, right? Like not, not, not having solved all the problems, is it possible and is it feasible to have a future of mobile fabrication? So you would sort of like, I have like a mechanical problem here. My bicycle is broken and I need to kind of find a solution for that. I'm carrying a printer with me. Again, hack together hardware of what is currently available. Print the object that I'm looking for. And you know, that would solve my problem. So while the hardware is obviously not quite where it needs to be, there is some sort of like, I think there is some sort of potential future here that would be interesting to, um, to work towards. Uh, but it certainly is a future that is like, you know, three decades away from now. So if we go back to that timeline and, and we look at like where, where we sit right now, we're not quite at that point yet. Right? We're not at the point where we need to make a pivot from millions of users to billions of users. But with fabrication, if you look at laser cutting, for example, there may be a few thousand laser cutters around the world in different fab labs and different like research labs and educational institutes, um, but certainly no millions of users yet, right? So there has been another pivotal moment in, in digital computing, which, uh, which is the, the kind of the, the critical pivotal moment that I'm trying to understand in my research. And that's what I spent like the last years kind of banging my head against, if you will. So what was that moment? What happened there in, in, in digital computing? And this is actually a question I like to ask when I'm teaching an introduction to programming to my students. And, uh, and they typically give me answers like, you know, um, um, a typical one would be object orientation, for example, right? It's like within the span of like the lifetime of these students, object orientation was the moment where a lot of like progress was made in terms of uh, computing languages. But I find it hard to argue why that would be the big kind of like pivotal moment that where we went from thousands to millions of users. 
I think the real moment that, that where, where that happened was the moment we introduced compilers. And we started to talk of a higher level uh, language for computing. We started to kind of abstract away from the hardware and uh, have languages that are still relevant up till today, right? Like it was the kind of the, the birth of languages like basic, Lisp and C, and, and they are still around. So like the software that was written since that moment has remained relevant. And I would be very curious to see what that means in the context of digital fabrication. So in the context of, of, of computing, uh, portability is the ability of software to be transferred from one machine or system to another. And typically we capture that in a practical way in the form of standards. And I will get back to that later why that is relevant. So a standard, a standard is an established normal requirement of a repeatable technical task. And the interesting thing is, is if you look at like the, the history of computing, right? Like compilers was the moment where people started to um, kind of write software that, that remained relevant. But we've seen the exact same thing happen in, for example, desktop publishing, where at some point Adobe came with the PostScript and PDF standards, um, which sort of was the moment where that field pivoted, right? Like at that moment, like all the stuff that was made since then is still relevant. You still find papers that were like kind of digitized back in, you know, the, 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 the 1990s. Um, and we've seen the same with digital video, digital audio, and essentially any field of, of digital uh, data at this point. All right, so if portability is the ability of something to be transferred from one machine or a system to another, what would that mean in the context of laser cutting, right? So in the context of laser cutting, I think that would be the models being transferred from one uh, machine or system to another. And so let's look at what, where we stand right now, because I started by praising this format that we are currently using for, for laser cutting, which is a beautiful format, right? Like the 2D cutting plans, um, I think they're reasonably portable. So if you look at like where they come from, um, there has been a time where, um, you know, Laser cutters were controlled in, in 65 with custom, custom electronics, right? Like custom uh, controls for the electronics that were built by, by the actual kind of builders of the same laser cutter. Then there has been a period where um, uh, G-code, which was developed at MIT, started to kind of come around in the 60s, but became the de facto standard for laser cutting around the 80s. Um, and then like the, the format that we're currently having is these, are these 2D cutting plans, right? Which are like one level again of abstraction higher than G-code, um, which can make use of colors to switch different modes and so there are some sort of like really big advantages and already some big steps towards portability if you think of it. But there are also some really big limitations of this format. So if I look back at this file, this thing here is a microscope. And um, when you laser cut this, like you want to have the different parts fit with respect to each other. So if I take this little part here on the side, I, I want it to fit inside that cutout on the other part when I laser cut it. But the thickness of these lines is not exactly something that is, that, that is defined. It's defined by the, the property of the laser cutter, by the amount of material that the laser removes. So if I have a laser that has like, that removes more material than another laser, um, the file, the, 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 the parts will fall apart. And if my laser cutter removes less material than the other laser, they will not even fit together. So there is a, like a large dependency on the actual machine in, embedded in that particular format. And not only does it happen at the points where you have joints, but also here, for example, where you want to hold a, a, an axle in place. So this is a bearing that wants to hold an axle in place. And again, if the bearing gets too tight, the axle will get friction. And if it gets too loose, the, the axle will start to wobble and terrible things happen to your microscope. So those are some sort of like, if we would manage to handle these two types of issues, we would in many ways have some sort of PDF format for laser cutting. We would have like something that works, that continues to work reliably on any laser cutter. But there might be something more, right? I told you before that this thing here is a microscope. And if you have a microscope and you want to change, for example, the focal range of your microscope, you want to change the dimensions of that, that tube on the top there. And you can imagine if you do that to this particular model, that has like an influence on all the other parts to some degree, right? Like they all need to scale accordingly. Uh, the whole thing needs to fit with respect to each other. So those type of transformations would be kind of what, what in, in the context of desktop publishing would be a Word file or your LaTeX file, which contains the actual kind of source code of how this thing is supposed to work. So. I started out by looking into these like these low level issues and to start to create like PDF as the format of like reliable sharing of, of, of models for laser cutting. And so let me show you how we achieved that. So here's the first attempt. Like we took the 2D cutting plans and we, because it's such a beautiful format, I want to see if I can kind of make it live. So we wrote a software, a semi-automatic software tool um, that converts like non-portable SVG files into uh, portable files for laser cutting. And um, there's two publications that are kind of connected to that, the SpringFit in WIS 2019 and in WIS 20 uh, curve canceling mechanisms. And here, this is roughly what it looks like. So it's a sort of browser tool um, implemented in TypeScript. And um, 
it allows you to load the SVG file right into the, uh, into the editor. And you can then use uh, certain like tools that we implemented in the software to modify that model and to turn all the uh, problematic elements into portable elements. And you will not fully understand what's going on now, but I will show you the same video again later on. And then you have some sort of sense of what, what, what is going on here. But you see, like I just click around in the file, change some of the mechanisms, some of the parts, and uh, the resulting microscope will be a portable microscope. So if we look at the microscope itself, this is what it looks like if it is optimized for one particular laser cutter and one particular material, right? So this is the, the thing assembled. And what we're trying to do is turn it into this equivalent microscope, which is a microscope where we made the joints in there portable and we made the mechanisms in there portable. So let's look at the joints first. So here is like the a close up of one of these elements of the, of the microscope. And this is like the, the cutout that you see here is where the other part needs to fit inside, right? And so this is a very non-portable joint because it's like the, the way this works is like um, you use, you compress the material and you stick the parts together. Um, this is, uh, the material is very intolerant to that modification. And therefore any small change in, uh, in, in the amount of material that's removed here uh, will make the, the joints fail. So what we're doing instead in SpringFit is that we take those joints and we convert them to um, portable springs or portable joints. And we use a cantilever spring here as the solution. So the great thing of this cantilever spring is that it allows the material to bend instead of compress, to which the material is much more tolerant. And as you see, it has now some sort of range of dimensions for which it will continue to work. So we use that principle to convert a series of, uh, of, of, of different types of joints um, to uh, curve independent joints, as well as like holding electronics in place, for example. So here you see like how this button is like mounted in exact, again in exactly the same way. So you add a cantilever spring next to it. Now you have enough tolerance. So independent of how, what laser cutter you use, this button is going to fit well inside there. So that is spring fit. The software tool that detects uh, joints and mounts in the models and replaces them with portable equivalents that are tolerant to variations in curve. But if you look back at that microscope, there were not only joints in there, right? There were also these moving parts, this bearing here. So I, again, I was wondering if we can solve the same problem also by modifying the, the 2D cutting plan. And we do that by inserting this moon-shaped inset right next to it. So if we zoom in, you see like this is like this crescent-shaped like inset that we have there. And the reason why we cannot just use a spring here is that you don't want to add additional friction to the, to the bearing. So we need to just make sure that the shape is the same, but not the forces that are applied on the axle. So let's zoom into that in, uh, in a bit more context to kind of get a sense of what's going on here. So this is here the bearing in, in, in uh, isolation, and it needs to hold that axle in place. And it continues to do so as I increase the amount of curve. And you see that like the inset constantly closes the gap exactly as caused by curve. And all the user needs to do is just rotate that inset in place. He doesn't need to understand like what the exact curve of the machine is or what material has been used. You just rotate it in the inset and then it will work out. And so like technically the way this works is that that, that, that moon shaped inset consists of two designed elements. One is the jammer, which is the curvature on the top. And one is an inverse scalar, which is the curvature on the inside. And the jammer is there to hold that, 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 that inset in place. So this, the shape of the jammer is derived from a nautilus spiral, um, which is a self-similar spiral that um, as, you, as, as curve would be applied to the model has the same curvature, right? Like you just like offset the, the spiral. So the curvature stays the same, but the shape gets smaller as, as a result of curve. Now, if you then rotate it in place, there is always going to be, because the curvature is the same, there's always going to be a moment where it locks, where it jams in place. All right, so that's how this thing holds itself in place. But at the same time, there's this inverse scalar because we need to hold the axle in place, right? We don't want to hold that, that inset in place, we really want to hold the axle. So what we're doing here is actually kind of pretty much the same thing. So we take the same self-similar spiral, but we flip it, which as a result, uh, as more curve adds to more rotation, now the additional curve adds to a decrease of the cutout size of, uh, of what the holds the bearing uh, in place, the axle in place. And so therefore we have a bearing that has a constant size. You see here at, at like uh, increased amounts of simulated curve, right? So like, uh, even if it would be milled, so like a very large amount of curve applied to the particular mechanism. So for that reason, we call these things curve canceling mechanisms. Mechanisms that continue to perform their functionality independent of the amount of material removed by the fabrication machine. And if we now look at that editor that we looked at in the beginning, you get some sort of sense of what's going on. So 
we take the microscope, we load it into that, into that software. And um, you see already that the software has tried to guess, like, like the highlighted elements here are kind of guessed uh, mechanisms that are implemented in there. Um, and now all the user needs to do is override some of the things or add additional information on mechanisms, which is not guessable from the, the, the model itself. Like if you look, for example, here, there's a sliding mechanism, that rectangle that is being modified now. From just a rectangle in the SVG, there's no way of telling that there would be a sliding mechanism there. So like the user needs to manually annotate these additional elements in there and then place these uh, mechanisms in place. So like override some of the other suggestions. And then the cool thing is that this thing has been SVG all along. So you can send this file directly to the laser cutter and, um, and you're good to go. Like you have a microscope that works independent of, of, of curve. Right, so like the mechanisms all continue to work reliably now. And they even continue to do so if you would mill the same model. So if you use a vastly increased amount of curve. And we've done this, we use the same method to kind of convert a whole range of models to uh, curve independent uh, models. And the nice thing is as a side effect, you can also use different materials now because that's also a factor of curve. So how well did we do, right? I wanted to achieve portability and I, I promised you some sort of PDF format for um, reliable uh, reproducibility of, of laser cutting files. So we kind of achieved that, I think, right? Like the resulting models cut on any laser cutter, uh, even on variations in materials. So in some sense, we have achieved portability here. But I can't help but wonder and look at this model and think that there is something excessive about what we did to that model, right? I mean, it's great that it works on any, on any laser cutter right now, but like there's also, a lot of additional cutouts that I added to the model, which you know has some sort of aesthetic impact, but also has some sort of reduction of the structural integrity of the overall uh, construction. So, and 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 on top of that, but what, what I really promised you guys is to also be able to modify these models, right? Like to take the microscope and change the length of the neck. Well, that just became even harder with all these additional incisions there. So, if we go back to the model, like we kind of achieved reasonable on, on the bottom two uh, problems, but the first one, we really haven't done anything so far, right? Um, so what if I want to make modifications to this model, All right? So here I have an, a VR headset and you might, you might have seen these as a Google Cardboard where you put the phone in the front and then you have like some, some lenses that you look through uh, and then you have like a reasonable VR experience for like uh, a few bucks. And you can do the same thing with a laser cut model. So here's a laser cut 3D model of that. And in 3D, it's, it's trivial to change, for example, the focal range of this thing, right? Like I have a different prescription with my glasses. Um, so I might want to have the phone a little bit further away from my eyes. In 3D, that's a trivial operation. You just stretch the, the front plate forward so you're good to go. But the actual format is the 2D cutting plans, right? This is what it looks like if you would download that particular model from the web. And making that same transformation is a lot more tricky at this point, right? So like, one obvious thing is that you want to change that, that top plate here, the one that you looked up on, on, on top of. And when you do that, like you also need to change that, that plate that connects on the side to that particular plate. So maybe we can try to do this together. So um, help, me, help me solve this model. Who thinks that um, this, this, this part here needs to change? If you think that I need to modify this part as well, raise your hand, otherwise um, remain quiet. <laughs> All right, so who thinks that this one has to change? What about this part here? Yeah, maybe, yeah, 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 I think so too. Like this is the part that is exact opposite to the, to the other plate that we were looking at. What about this plate? Yeah, 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 I, I agree. Like, I think we also need to change this one. This one here, the one that holds the lenses in place. Yeah. This one, what about this one here? So this is sort of the nose piece that sits in the middle of the model. I don't think so. So this is actually an interesting one. We had like quite some debate about this within the team as well, because like structurally it wouldn't be necessary because it's not really touching any of the other plates, but optically it would really help because it's like, it's the divider between the two eyes, right? Like, so like you don't want to have your right eye see the content of the left eye and the other way around. So it, it serves some sort of purpose, but it was just interesting that this is like, uh, it's non-trivial how to decide which plates need to be modified and which not. But in order to kind of solve this problem, I think what you guys have been doing and what I have been doing when I did this for the first time is like in my mind, reconstructing what a 3D model is supposed to look like. Then imagining what the modification that I want to make looks like. And then I, I kind of figuring out what that means on the individual plates. 
And that's a great process, right? But what if I just had that model in 3D to begin with? Why, why do I try to do this in, in, from a 2D cutting plan? Like that's just, that takes a lot of imagination on my side. And so the good news is that while I, uh, while I, the projects, uh, why I did the projects I just showed, we also have been working on something else, which is like transitioning towards 3D models for, uh, for laser cutting. And um, not only we, but also FlatFab has been doing that um, in, in our research community lately. So kind of proposing 3D modeling as a way to kind of make models for laser cutting. And so here's a bit of a preview of how that works. So I'm trying to make a coffee machine here in a software system called Cube, which was developed at our lab um, with, with an effort from the entire lab, by the way, it's not only my project here. And you see here, like how we kind of put together relatively quickly, a, a reasonably complex 3D model of, of that coffee machine. This, by the way, takes a really long time to do in 2D. Right. Of course, I want to have a logo on the front, right? But while I'm at it, why not brand it? <laughs> Rotate it in place. There you go. So like this was, this was sped up by a factor two, but in a very short amount of time, you have like a, a reasonable model that you can send to your laser cutter and you have there at your coffee machine done. And from a portability perspective, what is additionally interesting here is that you, can, you would export a model, right? Like, so you would, as you export the model, you pick the properties of your laser cutter and, um, and you would, in this case, for example, define the curve here. And as a result, you have like a model that will continue to work independent of what laser cutter you, you necessarily had. So, you know, big success. And on top of that, um, we have like, by now we have like uh, 500 beta users that have been testing this software. And so there's a large repository of models uh, that are all out there by now. And that, that are all inherently parametric, right? Like because they are modeled in a 3D modeling environment, making any of these changes is a trivial operation now. So it is great, right? Like we kind of succeeded at this point. Right? Like so like the, the, all, all the problems that I addressed in, in, in SVG, they are solved here. But if you look at the models that are all out there, there's like so much time that people have invested in making really good, well-engineered models that are being shared online right now. And not only those, there's also like whole companies that rely on, on, on laser cut models that they built in the past. And so I, I think it's very naive to think that if I propose like a nice 3D editor as a researcher, that suddenly the field will start adopting a new way of fabricating. I just don't, I don't buy into that because there is so much time that people have invested already in learning all of the tools and, and developing the tools that they have. They have. And so as a result, I think the 2D cutting plans actually end up remaining the standard, right? The de facto standard here. And the problem with standards is, well, they stick. So um, I don't know if any of you are playing the guitar, but like there is a, a, a format for sharing guitar tabs that was around when I was born, I think. And, um, you know, it, it, it kind of encodes all the information you need you know, to play the guitar with this. But, you know, this is still the format that we're using up to today because it just works reasonably well. And it's roughly the same with these, these 2D cutting plans. Like we can make them work. It's not as bad that, we, that it's really non-usable non somehow. And therefore they will stick around as a standard. So I think we need to do a little bit more here, right? So like, I think uh, the, the problem is like if 2D cutting plans stick around, this, this modification will end up being this, right? Like, so it's like that effort of reconstructing the entire model. And while this didn't seem, may not seem as painful as you might think it is, we ran a study with, uh, with, with, with 13 participants and uh, it took on average 24 minutes to mod make the modifications that we just did together. And uh, 11 out of 13 models failed when we tried to fabricate them. So there is something broken. But we can't help but think if we, if we do this whole reconstruction in our head, why don't we make a software tool that allows you to do the reconstruction? And that this kind of transfers the 2D cutting plan to a 3D model. This is a software system called Assembler Cube. Um, which makes use of the fact that, you know, like software like Cube allows you to export 3D to 2D, uh, but nobody has developed so far software that allows you to kind of convert the other way around from 2D to 3D models. And that's where Assembler Cube sits. This workflow, even though it's like a little workaround, if you will, is 10 times faster than, than the manual workflow of editing the 2D cutting plans and all models as a result would continue to work. So let's zoom a little bit into that, that algorithm to find out like what, what we're doing here. So this is what the software looks like. It's like you load the 2D cutting plans into your 3D editor and you know, a user can now just happily click together that 3D model and then make the modifications to that model. So this is assembly cube. It's a five-step algorithm that converts the 2D cutting plans in the format of uh, SVG into 3D formats like cube in this case. 
And so the way this algorithm is built up, it first detects the individual plates, like what is a plate and what is a cutout in the model. It then it tries to identify joints in that model. It uh, derives the material thickness from that information, matches up the joints, like which can, can, can be paired up together. And then in the last step, users semi-automatically assemble the 3D model as a result. And for the, in the interest of time and uh, for the purpose of this talk, I will focus on the last two steps of, of that algorithm, because those are the most kind of exciting ones algor algorithmically. All right, so this is what the cutting plan looks like from that VR headset. And I need your help here again. So we're going to find out how this thing, how the plates here have to be connected to each other. So I have this plate here in the middle, and I want to find out what other plate does that thing connect to, All right? So like who thinks it connects to this plate here? What about this plate? Yeah, this plate? Yeah, <laughs> there's a candidate. What about this plate here? Also, right. So like, interestingly for, for us as users or as humans, it's relatively easy to figure out what plates need to connect to each other. Um, I think what we, what we end up doing, and I think what you guys have just been doing is um, kind of looking at the profile of the joints and finding out which joints could roughly match to each other. And then with, with in, in the back of your mind, that 3D image of how the whole thing needs to come together. And so while that seems easy to do for a human, it's actually relatively nasty as a task for a computer because every joint would have to be compared to all other joints in the model for each of these steps of the, uh, of the assembly pipeline. And so this would be at best in some sort of quadratic performance, but it would probably end up being much worse than that. So this is not a great idea for like in, uh, implementing interactive software. But the cool thing in computer science is that there is some sort of solution here um, that allows you to um, store the joints in a different format in, in a table. And then you, you need some sort of lookup key to find that joint in that table, which is called the hash data structure. And if you have them stored in a hash, you just need to find the joints that are similar to the one that you're looking for and not for all the other joints and compare them all to each other. And this is roughly what you've been doing when you were like kind of going through this yourself as well, because you looked at the shape of this joint here and you have probably not even considered comparing it to this joint here. It's just so different. You don't need to see that. And so in the hash data structure, let's look at, no, let's look at this particular joint here to find out how that works in our hash data structure. So if I zoom into that joint, I have this finger here and I need to find out what cutout that mates with in the model. And so our initial assumption was like, okay, well, I want to just store the size of these fingers as the profile and then find the, the whole, the cutouts it can, can fit to. Um, nasty thing here, like the issue of curve, which we already kind of uh, touched upon a little bit is that like this finger wants to mate with a feature that is slightly smaller and slightly smaller is not a great de definition to look for in a hash data structure, right? Like you're just not going to find a hit. It's very uh, binary in its nature. So that's not gonna, gonna do great. But the good news is that there is a cutout that sits right next to this finger, which has been modified by exactly the same amount because like that, that finger needs to, uh, that cutout needs to fit to a finger somewhere else, which is offset by the same amount of curve by the user. So we realized if you take the sum of these two, we actually have a metric that we can use for, uh, for storing the joints in a hash that is independent to variations in curve. And so as a result, if we now look at this joint, uh, the, the profile of this joint in our hash data structure, we find six collisions in the model uh, or five collisions in the model. And those are the ones that you see high, light, lighting, lighting up here in orange. And so like, I only need to look through those to find a possible candidate match. Now, Six is still a nasty number, right? Like it's still not, not quite solved. It would be great if it was like perfect at this point. Um, but this is where, where we bring in some help of the user because like this ambiguating that, that, that difference is actually relatively straightforward for a user is like very complicated again for a computer. So this is the last step of our algorithm which is the interactive assembly. And um, as, I, as I showed you, like we, we load the SVG in the editor. And what you see is that at every step of the interaction only the relevant joints are high, uh, lighting up. And so the search space is very, very small for a user, but very easy to quickly kind of pick together. Sometimes still you might make a mistake and then there is this rotate icon that is now highlighted in orange and you can hit that and then override the suggestion that you kind of ended up with. But in this case, it was actually correct. So we can just undo that modification and continue to modify uh, to assemble the model. And it's all kind of relatively straightforward where the joints have to go now. And once you've done that, like given that you're already in a 3D editing environment, 
you can immediately start to modify the model. So in case like what, what my use case where I wanted to change the prescription of the VR headset, I just go ahead and use the stretch tool and, and, and do the interaction we just looked at earlier. But you could think of all kinds of other modifications that you can do now, like changing it higher so that it fits a bigger phone or changing the interocular distance or any of the other parametric modifications you could imagine on this particular model. And so we did that, uh, we, we used that same method to kind of reconstruct the hundred models that we found in online repositories. And this is just sort of fun to watch. So um, here I'm, I'm reconstructing a chair. Candle holder. A lot of really interesting models that people are sharing online actually. Uh, birdhouse. And you see sometimes uh, like the system gets it wrong and then you just like click once or two or twice on that rotate icon and, and you can move on from there. Here's the microscope we looked at before. A Raspberry Pi rack, which happens to be very popular among <laughs> hobbyists. A test tube rack for the more scientific angle on the perspective on the problem. And of course, we could not resist ourselves to also reconstruct a dinosaur. And these hundred other models that we found online. All right. So um, based on the success of like being able to reconstruct so many of these models, we actually were wondering if we can push this one step further and if we would be able to do this completely automatic. Because if, if you, you can imagine if you can convert all the models that are out online available uh, automatically, then suddenly the, the, the pivot towards 3D is a trivial, uh, trivial question, right? Everybody would want to be in 3D because it's just the richer format to interact in. Um, so here's a bit of a sneak preview of what is hopefully coming out at the next uh, WIST conference. I'm writing the paper as we speak. <laughs> um, so we're doing this roughly the same interaction, right? Load an SVG, but rather than only import, the, having the option to import the individual plates, it actually tries to also import a completely automatically assembled version of that VR headset. And when you click that, you immediately have like um, your results. So you don't even need to reconstruct the model or anything. Um, and, and you would just be able to immediately make your modifications to the model. And so the algorithm that kind of allows me to do that starts out by picking the plate that uh, has the most interest, like the most independent, like most different joints from the others. Um, and then like tries to use the hash data structure that we looked at before to um, find out which are the possible candidates like every joint can match with. So this joint here can match with these two plates, for example. And um, we then use a DB scan algorithm to kind of disambiguate plates that are the same. So in this particular case, for example, there is no need to search the, the plate twice. You only need to do that once. And the same goes for that other plate that was duplicated here. And you see that a lot in laser cut models actually. Um, and then, then we just continue to kind of assemble, like figure out what is the assembly tree of all of these parts. Uh, we furthermore try to reduce the ambiguity using um, an, um, a symmetry detection based on the algorithm that was presented by Niloy Mitra in uh, 2006 in uh, transactions and graphics. Um, and that allows us to further reduce the search space. So we do everything here to make the search space as small as possible, because obviously when you try to automate this, that is what, what determines your, your performance. So the last thing we do is we, uh, we construct the assembly tree from, from all the joints that we found so far. And, um, and we use a depth first search algorithm to really quickly get to a reasonable result. Uh, we score every state in between. So we kind of verify how good of a 3D reconstructed model this would be. And, uh, and then like pick the best choice every time. And then as we reach one final state, we reiterate. So we kind of take the best state that we've seen so far, um, continue down again to see if there's a better outcome. And, um, and, and we're currently still kind of tuning those parameters, like how many times we need to kind of iterate down and what is the best scoring metric for evaluating success of an assembled uh, model. Uh, currently we're able to kind of reconstruct about like 50 to 60% of the models that we've seen before. Um, and for the others, there's like some minor changes typically necessary to uh, get them in exactly the right shape. So in conclusion, we've, uh, I, I've shown you the problems that are occurring in SVG uh, laser cut formats, 2D cutting plan uh, format. And uh, we've looked at all these three different issues. I've shown you a, a workflow where we try to, um, or I, I presented you the idea of using 3D format as the 
right way of kind of approaching this problem and getting getting by all these issues that are occurring in, in laser cutting cutting plants. And then show you a workflow where we reconstruct 3D models so as to be able to modify them and, uh, and, and then use them in 3D properly. Um, I think that this is kind of in the, in the hierarchy of like how, how 2D cutting plants have developed or how laser cutting has developed the next big step. So I think like maybe somewhere in the late 2020s, we'll have 3D as the format for, for laser cutting. And so in that sense, I hope that we have kind of tackled to some degree the portability issues that happen in the context of laser cutting. And if we look at any of the fields that we've seen where that also kind of happened in the past, I think this, is, this shines a very bright light on the future of uh, laser cutting. Like with some luck, we might be able to make that transition, that, 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 that pivotal moment that happened in computing where, where compilers kind of allowed us to go from thousands of users to millions of users um, in the context of laser cutting as well by introducing um, these, these, these uh, 3D formats. And that allows us as researchers to start dreaming a little bit further already of what that next kind of step is going to be. And who knows, maybe it's going to be mobile fabrication where we pivot from millions of users to billions of users. So on that note, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I look very much forward to question Q&A session with everyone. Thank you. All right. Who, who is, uh, is Rachel here? Are you, uh, no, is Rachel gone? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, are you handling, or Elaine, are you handling the Q&A or do you? We never discuss these things. We should do them. Okay. I know Elaine is having to head off at two because she's got a yeah. study interview, so I probably should do this. Um, thank you very much for the talk. I was sitting there thinking, how can I use this? What can I use it on? And yeah, I need to get that app right now and start doing things with it. it it's amazing. It looks absolutely brilliant. I have spent a lot of time um, doing lace cutting probably for the last 15 years. And yeah, something like this will save a lot of time off from Illustrator. So yeah. great. Yeah, I, mean, I, I personally also like, I mean, I've been, been using laser cutting now for like, you know, like 10, 10 years as well. And started out in industrial design where like laser cutters were sort of the tool to, to, to fabricate with. Um, yes. Got spent a lot of frustration in, in Illustrator and <laughs> related software. Um, yeah, so like um, Cube itself, the 3D modeling environment is, is a software that, that uh, Patrick Baudish is releasing currently as a, a startup. So um, it is in beta testing right now. Uh, we have like, as I said, like some, some five, 600 users that are kind of beta testing it at the moment. And um, we are slowly starting to roll it out, particularly in, in educational context so far. Uh, as like workshops for students like who want to just kind of have multidisciplinary courses where they kind of use fabrication as the platform for you know working across across different disciplines mm -hmm. so um, yes we start to roll it out at the moment um, to solve your immediate needs um, I am not the one who's handing out the uh, the, the invites for the software tool mm -hmm. um, but I'm sure that if you send me an email I can I can make something happen here <laughs> sounds good um, sounds good indeed <laughs> so yeah, so like I mean, it's it's very much I mean, it's still very much under development, right? Like I mean, um, it works it works really well as is, uh, but we are like thinking of all kinds of ways to uh, to extend it, still kind of do more interesting stuff with it. Uh, one interesting thing that I kind of by reconstructing these three D models in the context of Cube, um, we sort of enforced the uh, the editor environment to become more flexible towards also making models that are consisting of individual plates rather than volumes. Right. If you look at the coffee machine that I made, it was very much volumetric, right? It's like voxels kind of click to, towards each other. Um, but like by kind of extending it in these interesting ways, there is like all these additional kind of uh, tools that, that kind of start to live up. So we are, we're certainly extending it a lot. Um, there, will be, there will be a moment it goes public, but right now it's still very much in, in, in development still. No, it's great. Yeah, no, I, I can't wait to use it. It looks absolutely amazing. Yeah, um, uh, drop, drop me a line. <laughs> I will do. I'll definitely do that. And you've raised your hand. I think Pete has uh, raised his hand first. Uh, okay. okay, yeah, just um, just quick. Yeah, so this is really, really great work. And uh, something is I've done laser cutting for a similar amount of time. I've definitely had in mind about going going back and forth between, uh, you know, I should be using Fusion and doing 3D models and then actually just using Illustrator. Mm. So this is, this is really good stuff. Um, so one question is, does this remove people away from the material process slightly. So I remember like the first thing I always do is end up doing a test cut and I do like how deep, how hot, you know, what speed, and then use that as the kerf as well. So I'm kind of testing kerf and material. 
is that potentially built into this at some point like you know is there a test test piece generator <laughs> oh there <laughs> is yeah. yeah yeah okay yeah. okay great question yeah um yes we we do so like actually um uh, when like the, the 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 workflow that i showed you was like where i picked the curve so to say right like i can i can kind of go back to that but like um so i just like kind of decided that it was like 0.12 millimeters or something um here uh, but you also have the possibility to uh, not uh, specify the curve there. And then indeed we would produce a curve strip, which is like some sort of test strip that you would cut. And then you would, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you would have like different finger joints. And like at some point it, it sticks properly, it, it fits well. And then uh, that's the curve you yeah, want you to can use. put the number in. Perfect. Yeah, yeah perfect. Um, and another, another dimension that you didn't ask explicitly, but that is actually kind of interesting as a result of uh, especially automatic uh, reconstruction is um, not so much the disconnection towards um, the material, but more like how the model works. Because imagine that you you kind of you downloaded that VR headset and you automatically got a 3D model out of that. Um, at this point, you just don't know if what how that thing is 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 working somehow, right? Like like how the plates are connected to each other or anything. Yeah. You don't need to know that, which is great. Um, which which does come at some sort of price that like um, when you um, have the automatically reconstructed model, you still need to verify that it's actually correct. Because like yeah. as I said, like we we reach like 60% accuracy here. Um, yeah. To make that decision, that is still a very interesting one. And what we are currently looking into is um, previewing how the plates come together. So a little animation as you import it, rather than having immediately the result, like showing how the plates kind of have been assembled as some way to kind of still teach about uh, yeah, what the model does. Yeah, so have, having that mental model is definitely, it ends up being like weirdly enjoyable. So what might be <laughs> <That> frustrations <laughs> being like, and like, you know, you'd be walking around with a very complex model in your head for a week at a time. That's great. right, yeah. that's right. So there's a, there's, there's a generally an other dimension there. That's like us, like all of us in this call and, and those people who are using laser cutting right now are um, what, what we refer to as tech enthusiasts, right? Like we, we enjoy, we get a kick out of laser cutting and indeed that process of figuring out how it, how it needs to come together and all that. Um, when I talk about the transition towards millions of users or even like presumably billions of users, right? Like the normal consumers somehow, um, that's a different mindset that kind of lives there. I think when um, my, my, my father would want to kind of uh, have a, a, a modified model, he would not care all that much about like exactly how the thing is constructed, but he would just want to have that VR headset that has the right uh, prescription, right? Um, so there's that other kind of like, I think certainly in the transition phase where we are right now, it's super important to consider the, the joy of modeling. Um, I think when we really talk about the larger kind of uh, adoption in society, I think we also need to think of ways to kind of um, actually kind of distance a little bit from that as in like you have a certain purpose that you want to achieve and you don't want to think about what plate I need to stretch in order to change the prescription of the model. Yeah. So this is like a very interesting tension that is like created by who we are, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Baked into the uh, process. Thank you. Great. Um, Anne, you've raised your hand initially. Yeah. Yeah, um, thank you so much. I mean, this was a, a really cool talk. And I think I want to use that moment as well, because I know there is some PhD student in the call uh, to just highlight how great your, your, your story is, right? Because it's not just a, you know, a collection of interconnected paper that you have here. You also have a vision that's sort of like, you know, really trying to think about like, what is it going to be like, you know, in 10, 20 and 50 years. And I think this is a really great example of how to do that really beautifully. So, Thank you. so thanks. Um, on that note, actually, I'm curious to know what you think about. So, so you, you do this parallel between computing and, and now if you think about it, computers are obviously everywhere around us, but, but also very present in our, in our work environment. You know, we are using computers to, for all, lots of jobs all around the world. So do, do you have to think about like how that vision of yours can be instantiated into a, the work, you know, environment, like, you know, in, in 20, 50 years, how do you envision that happening, for example, if you have any idea? Yeah, so that, that, that's a great question, a big one also. Like if I, if I had to answer, then <laughs> I guess I, I, I should, should be doing, you know, like solving that as soon as I can. Um, the thing here is like, I, I think, I think what, what is really interesting here is like indeed again, drawing the parallel with computing where um, when, um, when somebody would have given a presentation about the future of computing, like, like, like 40 years ago, um, the way we are using it right now would have been unimaginable, right? Like we're solving like, like, like computing, like data problems on the spot, wherever we are at 
like if I'm lost in a city, I just look up the map, I'm, I'm good to go somehow, right? Like I just like, I kind of, rather than going home and figuring out like where the map is and then like the whole kind of process you can think of as well. Um, so when it comes to mechanical problem solving, we haven't evolved much. Like uh, we're pretty much like um, accepting the fact that something is broken when something would break or um, not, not even thinking of like how to mechanically um, solve the problem, but rather like avoid the situation. Like for example, the, the, the scenario I showed in the very beginning, right? My bike lamp is broken. Okay, well then I'll drive it without a bike lamp or maybe I just don't go on my bicycle or I take a car or anything else, right? We, we are really good at like hacking our way around like the mechanical problems that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. So one thing I would really like to, um, to see as a result of like increased access to fabrication would be that we not only start to use fabrication to solve these mechanical problems, but also start to think more about um, what we can mechanically do to kind of make our life better somehow. So like make that part of integrated thinking the same way um, that when, when, when you're now like kind of lost navigating, you're not thinking of like, you know, finding a store that sells maps, but you're thinking of like, okay, I need to find this, look this up on my phone, right? Similar kind of way, like there's another mentality that comes with that type of situation. So that's like one on the, on the problem solving side of the spectrum. Um, I think the other one is like more like the creative end of like the, the, the open and like the, the part we cannot even imagine right now, like what, what is all possible when you start to uh, really solve, uh, like, like do interesting things with fabrication. Like in particular, what, what, I, what has always surprised me a little bit is if you are not surprised me, it's like kind of logical, I guess, but if you look at the models that are being shared online right now, um, they're somewhat abysmal, right? I mean, let's all be honest with each other. Like, and we, we are all devoted to this, I guess, but <laughs> um, there's a lot of models that are, that are not great. And I think a result, like the reason, a part of the reason of that is, is the lack of um, ability to work on, to build on the work of others. So if you look at, like, and this is also, again, where I think like these, these more kind of um, parametric models are an enormous step forwards or potentially enormous step forwards. Um, the same way that like uh, the, the code that was written before compilers were around, has become largely irrelevant, right? Like it's, it's, we don't use that code anymore because there's like better programming languages by now. It makes a lot of sense. Um, I think that we are somewhat in a similar stage right now when it comes to these models. So the models that we see right now, they don't reflect the potential that uh, fabrication has, I think. And um, I think that is like one on the kind of the more community aspect of this uh, is gonna be a big sh uh, shift where we start to really uh, go beyond what one person can do, like what one single person can produce. Uh, and really kind of start leveraging like the same way you see it in open source where people build like enormously complex software systems as, as a community effort. Um, and then the other thing on the more industrial side of that is that um, I think the role of um, industrial designers, for example, is going to shift dramatically as, um, as, as we start thinking more about these kind of customizable uh, products. Like I think right now, if you like the, the fair answer to the future of fabrication might be Amazon, right? If, if, if you like, if Amazon can deliver in one hour and it's going to happen, I think in the next five years, um, then, you know, why would you even bother to fabricate something, right? And the answer, the, the, the counter argument is customization, I think, right? Like the fact that you can make something that not everybody else has is where fabrication stands really big. Or if you want to make things that actually fit to you rather than to the average person who doesn't exist, right? That's yeah. where fabrication can make a dent, I think. I think the, the other, where you were talking as well, the other aspect is sustainability, right? Because, you know, obviously, you know, buying things whenever you have something broken is not necessarily like a... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so I like your point of, you know, trying to sort of shift that, you know, which we had probably like before the whole industrial society happened, right? When you had like yeah. a house and a table that is broken, you just fix it, right? You know, we don't necessarily do that. That's obviously, right. You know... So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's very interesting. Also, again, like related to the same, like um, when I said that Amazon might be the answer to fabrication, Amazon is also what caused that, that kind of downgrade of, of mechanical thinking somehow, right? Mm -hmm. um, right now, if, if something is broken, you just like, you, you, you order the replacement. It's just like, it's, it's, it's bizarre. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense. Um, and so like, yeah, maybe there, there is indeed certainly also an angle of, of sustainability and where fabrication can play a massive role, I think. Well, thank you. Thank right. you. Great question. Um, Luna. Yeah, uh, thank you for the really great talk. Um, yeah, I'm excited at the prospects of this and uh, actually trying out the software myself at some point. Um, this question is kind of, 
going from the last discussion point and it's really looking at the future direction of the work and you know like especially in fabrication in general um you know we create a lot of static objects the work that you're doing here have you considered sort of the potential of exploring sort of more adaptive models and models with active components and you know going sort of from the discussion point about um you know um instead of just making one thing that just fits once creating something that you know as you change shape for example it will also adapt and get bigger or larger is that something that you've considered i think that like with the microscope example you kind of alluded to that a little bit with that changing right, um, right. but yeah is that something that you think would be a good future direction for what you're doing um absolutely yes i think like um models with mechanisms are things that, cer that certainly excite me and also like indeed like more higher level like shape changing or dynamic models it's like super exciting um i have a slightly different take on that i think here uh, because I, th I think like um there is another dimension of like the future of fabrication which which is a little bit overshadowed by the fact that i've just been talking about laser cutting so far that is that um i think if you look if you look at any object around you that has been produced not by personal fabrication, but in any other way, it always consists of like multiple materials, um, different fabrication processes. Um, it's, it's very unlikely that it's all kind of 3D printed or all laser cut or any of these. So I think a major step forwards for fabrication is to kind of embrace that, that, that fact that, there, that, that things are consisting of different uh, fabrication yeah. techniques, materials, um, and, and so like, I don't, I, I would, I would think it is very naive to try to answer your question in the context of laser cutting only, because mm -hmm. like, I think that this, this is a sort of framing that doesn't make too much sense. Mm -hmm. So what we are doing right now as well is um, extending um, cube or like just to sort of like 3D modeling for laser cutting by embedding external components. So like things that have been 3D printed or things that, that, that like, like, like the electronics that you saw before, right? Like if you want to mount a button on the, like, making that, that, that game controller with these buttons on there, oh. only using laser cutting can probably be done. Right? Like, I, I'm sure you can create buttons like with laser cutting with some sort of crazy mechanism, which has, has some spring and a latch. And like, I'm, I'm sure there is a way to do that. And again, like we as tech enthusiasts might get a guy might get a hard on from that. Um, but I think like um, when you really think about the right way of fabricating this thing, um, you want to embed electronics in it, right? Yeah. Looking a little bit into the context of like um, embedding uh, other mo uh, materials and models in the models that we are making. And I think there is a big future for also like indeed more dynamic kind of adaption of models and um, mm -hmm. the integration of different fabrication techniques. Yeah, I think especially looking into sort of ma utilizing material properties to actually develop um, active components as well. You know, you have conductive filaments, you have clear perspex that can be used to manipulate waveguides and light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's actually quite a nice way of looking at it for the future yeah and there's just so many beautiful properties of materials right like that you can still leverage that that that, that have not even been part of this discussion somehow but like just the optical qualities of acrylic or the kind of the flexible qualities of leather or any of these dimensions mm. is, is, is super exciting to kind of do more of i think yeah. yeah but i think fundamentally the answer it would it would fundamentally be naive to kind of answer that with only uh, plywood laser cuts somehow like yeah. i don't think that's i don't think that's where this needs to be <laughs> yeah Cool. Um, I'm, gonna have to shoot, I'm shooting off for a meeting at two, but I'd just like to say thanks for the great talk. Yeah, really inspiring stuff. And look forward to having a play again. We yeah. went back in the lab. <laughs> Thank you so much. And, and I will come by someday when everything is, is better. Like oh, I yes, exactly. great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, thanks. Thank Good you. Luck for the, the, the thesis and so on. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, I know that people have got meetings to go at two o'clock, so if they need to disappear, mm. I think they have done. Um, Oli, are you still there? Yes. Okay, Oli, uh, have uh, a question. Hi, uh, really, really interesting talk and uh, very interested in your work. Um, I, I wanted to ask about uh, the uh, impact of adoption and uh, the impact of your, like the short-term impact of your work, because clearly you've got this great vision for like the long-term impact and you've also got this like uh, very strong sequence of publications. <laughs> And I wanted to sort of ask you a more broad, a more broad question about how how that short term impact influences your project, uh, like the design of your project, um, and and how how much does the excitement relating from those projects um, reflect reflect the actual like uh, implementations that users have done on them, 
or is that just something that's separate for you? Is that as, as a deliverable? Is that something that you should go back to? Yeah, I mean, like short term impact is. Uh, I think it's it's not necessarily what what excites me as a researcher. Like I like to kind of think like of the slightly longer uh, arc of like where 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 the field is going and how I can kind of enable. Like I think I think a lot of short term impact is like where what 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 would be really well done by by industry and by people who are just focused on actually implementing the right thing somehow. Um, so a lot of my work kind of focuses more on like, how can we enable a certain pivot? How can we kind of look at where the field is going and, and change that, that course and, and, and kind of, you know, like tilt it on, on a more high level somehow. Um, obviously with the fact that like what I just mentioned before, like Cube is, is getting shipped actually, right? Like we're, we're at a point where um, this is turning into commercial, if you will, software. Um, so there is some sort of short-term impact. There are people actually using our stuff right now. Um, and that's actually pretty exciting to see, I have to say. Like, I mean, <laughs> it's like, um, you know, you, you see people actually struggling with some of the things that we have been trying to put together and that, that therefore has a big impact on how we also do the interaction design and how we try to make the, um, the software as accessible as possible somehow, right? That, that kind of um, give, give people already something useful right now and then when, whenever the real transition to 3D is happening, uh, we'll have something that's great by that time. <laughs> so we're kind of still kind of incrementally improving the software that, that we're looking at. Um, but it, I don't feel that necessarily as my academic contribution somehow, you know, like as a, I, I hope to move on as, as I, I'm, I'm going to be on a job market um, next year in the academic job market. So I would like to move on as a, as a professor um, and um, Kind of start raising more of these bigger questions of where the field is going somehow rather than um uh trying to build the be most beautiful software for now somehow and sometimes it can go inside right like i think i mean honestly i'm super excited that we can can um, uh, use cube here as a platform to build the tools because like it, it has already a lot of these very um kind of product-ish kind of uh aesthetic and features to it so therefore actual users will start start kind of playing around with the tools that I built. If I had just built this in a vacuum uh, in like my research kind of lab and, and, and without that yeah, with the 12 participants that you need for Kai or whatever, um, then of course there would be no way to learn from that really. Like then it's just like, then it really just stays at like shooting out an, an, an idea somehow. So it's a, there's a sort of sweet spot here and um, I'm very excited about that. I think it's very interesting, but my real kind of, um, the motivation for my work does not lie there, so to say. Thanks. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, do we have any more questions at all? Uh, Richard. So I, I was just looking at Cube, thinking how handy it looked. Um, uh, but then a lot of the things I've been making lately are mechanical assemblies. They often have shafts and bearings. They often have bolts that hold things together. Um, and so the interesting thing about, well, two interesting things about those. One is that they're not present in the laser cut yeah. diagram. So from, from assembler's point of view, there's a whole set of things that, that you can't see. But then I was wondering how terrible a thing it was for Cube to have to support all that stuff, <laughs> whether you've thought about the, the number yeah. of extra bits That's right. that have to go in <laughs> to support that kind of use case. Yeah, yeah. So very true, right? Like um, things that are not embedded in the SVG or not like visible in the SVG will not be visible to to assembler cube, and uh, therefore will not make it into the reconstruction algorithm somehow. Um, that's a bit of a pain, I have to say. <laughs> there are certainly some like some very exciting models that I would love to have um, to to be able to actually kind of modify in three D are ones, of course, that also contain mechanisms and all the other types of uh, embedded components. Um, as I mentioned before, that we are looking into kind of embedding external um, materials and, and, and um, things in the laser cut objects. So we're sort of transitioning for cube in that direction. Um, but I think for automatic reconstruction or for reconstruction in general, um, that is still far out somehow because like there is just like, I mean, we, you, could, you could try to model the same thing in cube again. That's probably the closest you could get somehow. Like it's like, oh, this plate here was actually held together by bolts. Well, then let me add a plate there, like an actual cube plate, so to say. Um, yeah. That is sort of the closest that will come. Um, the other side of that spectrum is that I think um, those models are made by people like you who are also very um, um, kind of skilled at doing that somehow, right? Um, right, but I still don't want to have to go and 
fiddle with them when I change the design. Yeah. If I hand it off to somebody, it'd yeah, be right. lovely to hand it off in a portable way. I fully agree. Yes. <laughs> I, I wish I wish I had I wish I yes. wish we had it. I mean, we had like so in assembler cube, uh, like in in um, um, in uh, curve cancelling mechanisms. We looked at, into mechanisms, right? Like so, laser cut mechanisms are certainly uh, something we can handle in that context. Um, yeah. But it's like it, it it is not a parametric kind of modifiable model then that you have as a result. So that's sort of where that sits right now. Yeah. Uh, if you have ideas for this, I would be very happy to brainstorm <laughs> with you. <laughs> okay, I'll have to think. I'll let you know. Yeah. Yes. I think really. Brilliant. Um, I think everybody here has asked a question. So um, yeah, just to say thank you very much. Um, it's a brilliant talk. I will definitely be emailing you to try to get access to the software. It looks absolutely brilliant. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and we would also like, I mean, as we are still learning about like, uh, you know, from those 500 like beta users and everything, we're also very happy if you then share like uh, things you build or um, like kind of use cases that you found and that we haven't thought of maybe that, that that's like there's we can all learn from this so I'm I'm very sure we will share this with you <laughs> yeah no, it's right. just like I kind of publicly advertise that that we like kind of give out uh, invite codes <laughs> or something like that <laughs> yeah no, my other half has got a lot of laser cut um, models he does a lot of tabletop gaming it's an insane oh, way that's to great. get done with laser cut things so yeah. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to see that. And uh, thank you all so much for, for being here. I think I had a great time. I um, hope you guys had some fun too. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.